No pestilence had ever been so fatal or so hideous. Blood was its avatar and its seal. The redness and the horror of blood. There were sharp pains and sudden dizziness, and then profuse bleeding at the pores with dissolution. And the whole seizure, progress and termination of the disease were the incidents of half an hour. But the Prince Prospero was happy and dauntless and sagacious. When his dominions were half depopulated, he summoned to his presence many hale and light-hearted friends to the deep seclusion of one of his castellated abbeys. This was an extensive and magnificent structure, the creation of the Prince's own eccentric yet august taste. With these precautions, the courtiers might bid defiance to contagion. The external world could take care of itself. In the meantime, it was folly to grieve or to think. The prince had supplied all the appliances of pleasure. These and security were within. Without was the red death. It was towards the close of the fifth or sixth month of his seclusion that the Prince Prospero entertained his friends at a masked ball of the most unusual magnificence. It was a voluptuous scene, that masquerade. The tastes of the Duke were peculiar, and it was this which had given character to the masqueraders. and phantasm. There were arabesque figures with unsuited limbs and appointments. There were delirious fancies such as the madman fashions. There was much of the beautiful, much of the wanton, much of the bizarre, something of the terrible, and not a little of that which might have excited disgust. To and fro there stalked, in fact a multitude of dreams, and these, the dreams, writhed in and about, causing the wild music of the orchestra to seem as the echo of their steps. It was in the last chamber that stood a gigantic clock, and when the minute hand made the circle of the face, and the hour was to be stricken, there came a sound which was of so peculiar a note 
marked an emphasis that there was a brief disconcert of the whole gay company. For a moment, all is still and all is silent. The dreams are stiff frozen as they stand. But the echoes of the chime die away and a light half subdued laughter floats after them as they depart. And now again the music swells and the dreams live and writhe to and fro more merrily than ever. The revel went whirlingly on there commenced the sounding of midnight upon the clock, and there was an uneasy cessation of all things as before. But now there were twelve strokes to be sounded by the bell of the clock, and perhaps that more of thought crept with more of time into the meditations of those who reveled. And thus too it happened that before the last echoes of the last chime had utterly sunk into silence, there were many individuals in the crowd who had found leisure to become aware of the presence of a masked figure which had arrested the attention of no single individual before. The figure in question had gone beyond the bounds of even the prince's indefinite decorum. The whole company seemed now deeply to feel that in the costume and bearing of the stranger neither wit nor propriety existed. Who dares? Who dares insult? Us with this blasphemous mockery. Seize him and unmask him, that we may know who we have to hang at sunrise. For the mask which concealed the visage was made so nearly to resemble the countenance of a stiffened corpse. His vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of the face, was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. But from a certain nameless awe with which the mad assumptions of the mummer had inspired the whole party, there were found none who put forth a hand to seize him, so that unimpeded he passed within a yard of the prince's person. And while the vast assembly, as if with one impulse, shrank from the centers of the rooms to the walls, he made his way uninterruptedly. But with the same solemn and measured step, 
which had distinguished him from the first, through the blue chamber to the purple, through the purple to the green, through the green to the orange, through this again to the white, and even thence to the violet, ere a decided movement had been made to arrest him. It was then, however, that Prince Prospero, maddening with rage and the shame of his own momentary cowardice, rushed hurriedly through the six chambers, while none followed him on account of a deadly terror that had seized upon all. Now was acknowledged the presence of the Red Death. He had come like a thief in the night, and one by one dropped the revelers in the blood-bedewed halls of their revel, and died each in the despairing posture of his fall. And the life of the ebony clock went out with that of the last of the gay, and the flames of the candles expired. And darkness, and decay, and the red death held illimitable dominion over all.